are behind The catch is my fall You are the friend That answers my call You are my day You are my night You are my love You are my I'm Steve Carr, pastor of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande, and I'd like to welcome you to our program. Marriages and families are in great turmoil today in our country, I'm sure you would agree. But how is your marriage doing? What's going on behind the door of your home? Is your marriage in trouble? Have you given up thinking that there are no solutions, no answers to the struggles you're having with your spouse? Well, I want to encourage you today, there are answers, and they're found in God's Word. I believe the one who created marriage knows how it works best. And so will you get your Bible, get your spouse, and ask God to open your heart to His truth. Isaiah chapter 1. Now to begin with tonight, we want to look at well, a very general topic, a series of general topics on how to build a better marriage. And that's really, that's the title of our uh, series here that we, we would like to do with you. And in this series, um, this first study is just, just a very good general exhortation and encouragement to you, uh, some of the most basic issues that will enable you to have a better marriage. In the next three studies, what I'd like to do is to illustrate the principles I'm going to go over with you tonight through the book of the Song of Solomon. And a very uh, beautiful uh, letter of love from Solomon to his wife, uh, a, just the most beautiful poetry and uh, so uh, delicately done. Uh, describing the intimate relationship between uh, he and his wife. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage you to just stop and just consider your marriage tonight. Do you want a better marriage? I believe you do or you wouldn't be here. And so I'm confident that you have a desire for more in your marriage. And that's a good thing because there is always more. God wants to give to you abundantly above all that you can ask or think. That is His desire. And so not, no matter where you're at in your individual relationship tonight, there is more. There is something better for you ahead. You know, in the scripture it tells us that we are as Christians to seek a better country. That is a heavenly country. And so if we are to seek a better country, it's because it's better. You see, that heavenly kingdom that we're seeking is going to be better than what we have here. And that means that there is God, that is God's intent. He always has something better ahead for you. And so building a better marriage is a lifelong experience and a lifelong labor of love. And so how do you do that? What does it require to have a better marriage? Well, the first thing that I believe you need to have is you need to have a willing heart. A willing heart to build a better marriage. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, is probably one of the most uh, basic and yet uh, uh, more, most fundamental principles in Scripture. Here Isaiah declares to God's people, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. 
But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If you are willing and obedient, that's all God requires, a willing heart, and yet a willing heart to do something, to take action. See, many times people will say, Steve, I am so willing. Uh, and it's one of the first things that I ask couples to do in marriage counseling, usually, is I ask them to rate themselves from 1 to 10. 10 meaning they are willing to do anything and everything that God requires them to have a better marriage. One would, of course, declare that you didn't even want to be there. And your spouse has uh, drugged you here, and that's it. And so I ask couples to tell me, where, where would you put yourself on that scale? And I'd like you to do that as well tonight. Where would you put yourself on that scale? How willing are you to do whatever God would require you to do? You see, when you have a, a very high degree of willingness, then you will do something. You see, when someone tells me they have, they rate themselves, oh, I'm an 8 or a 9 or a 10, Steve. And then I ask them to do certain things and I give them homework and they don't do anything. Then I tell them, well, I don't think you are as willing as you think you are. And because there's no action. You see, willingness has to be coupled together with obedience. If you are willing and obedient you will eat of the good of the land. God has some good things in store for your life personally and your marriage uh, together with your mate. God wants to do good things in you and through your relationship. But that means you have to be willing and obedient if you're going to experience that. You see, willingness is the key to obedience. And so I would ask you to stop and address that in your own heart and just ask yourself, are, are, am I willing? Am I truly willing? And how can I demonstrate that willingness by the things that I do? You see, the willingness to please God is really where it all begins. That's the most fundamental, it's the ultimate motivation that you need. Lord, I, I want to please you. And I want to demonstrate that by my faith and my obedience towards you. If I am, want to demonstrate my willingness towards my wife, then I have to do something as well. And it will entail pleasing her. You see, when two people are trying to please each other and please the Lord, they're going to have a great marriage. Because First and foremost, an individual says, I want to please you, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, he'll, he'll give you all the direction you need right in his word. And then if you say, how can I please you, dear? I'll tell you, if that request is in harmony with the scripture, go for it. And as you show your willingness by pleasing one another, I'll tell you, you will grow. Now, when couples come to me for counseling and they state to me, well, Steve, I don't want to change, uh, you know, the parental uh, differences that we have. I I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Or I don't want to address the sexual problems that we have. Or I don't want to address the communication problems that we have. And they demonstrate that by their action or inaction, as the case may be then I say to them, you are not willing. You're really demonstrating unwillingness by your stubbornness and your selfishness. And so ask yourself, look at your own life, examine your own heart. How selfish are you? How stubborn are you? How prideful are you when it comes to addressing the issues in your relationship? Because that will reveal a whole lot about how willing you really are. And so if your mate is telling you all the time, honey, you are so selfish in this area, or so stubborn when I speak to you about this issue, that means that you are unwillingness, unwilling. Stubbornness 
selfishness equal unwillingness. That's the equation you must come up with. Now, if you want to change it, James chapter 4, verse 2 says, if you have not, it's because you ask not. Just ask. That's all you have to do. Ask the Lord for a willing heart. When you sincerely cry out to God and ask Him for willingness in your, your heart, He'll give it to you. This is His desire. It says in uh, James 3.17, the wisdom that comes from above, one of the items that he lists there is a willingness to yield. A willingness to yield. That demonstrates that you are receiving wisdom from above. If God is speaking to your heart, he's going to give you wisdom. And that wisdom will always encourage you to be willing to yield or to give in your relationship. What's the opposite of, of giving? It's selfishness. And so, this issue is very clearly connected together. So it's important that you address this in your life. Secondly, if you want to build a better marriage, then you have to be willing to develop your spiritual life. Now, this again is probably the first thing that I ask couples concerning when they come in for counseling. I ask them, what kind of spiritual life do you have? Do you go to church? How often do you go to church? Do you read your Bible? How often do you read your Bible? Do you pray? How often do you pray? Do you pray with your spouse? How often do you pray with your spouse? And that really gives me a good understanding about where that individual uh, is in their personal spiritual life. And then it, it also gives me an understanding of where the two are together, you see. Because your spiritual life is the key to a better marriage. But first you have to be willing. And this is the first place you need to be willing over. You need to say, God, give me a willing heart to develop my spiritual life. You see, every marital problem is a spiritual problem. That is what it is at its root. It's a spiritual problem. You see, when somebody tells me that uh, their mate is exploding uh, in anger towards them, or they are belittling them, or they are constantly critical of them, or um, they're manhandling them, pushing them around, then I, I, all of those things are spiritual issues. They're issues of the heart. And that person has a need to grow spiritually in their personal relationship with Christ. That is the bottom line. The reason why it's the bottom line is because without Christ there is no power to love. There is no power to give and to, to live unselfishly. The root of my nature is selfishness. That's that's the person I am. That's the person you are. We are selfish individuals. And so, what changes that? What enables me to live anything different than that? Well, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. I need to walk in the Spirit. And to be controlled and ruled by the Spirit of God. You see... Either Christ reigns in your life or self reigns in your life. There is really no in-between. Every day, if you look back on your day, you will have to ask yourself, you know, if this was a good day, why was it a good day? It's because Christ really reigned and ruled in my heart and my mind. That's why. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. If it was a bad day, why? Well, it's because I was running the show. I was walking in my own strength and my own power, and I'm not going to do real good when that's the case. And so, either Christ reigns or self reigns. And the only way that changes is by developing your spiritual life on a daily basis, 
seeking God through prayer, through His Word, asking God to rule inside of you and fill you with His Holy Spirit. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see, notice there, if you are to submit yourselves one to another, it's because you fear God, in the fear of God, because you reverence and respect Him. That's why you would submit yourself to one another. Now, submitting yourself one to another is the opposite of selfishness, isn't it? And so, we do that because we are submitted to the Lord. We are committed to Him. We reverence God. We fear God. And so, we yield and we give to one another. Now, if you remember uh, back in the book of Genesis, I mean, probably the, the best example of, of how a spiritual problem brought about all kinds of marital and family problems is Genesis chapters 1 through 4. There you see the testimony of God's Word. He says, He creates, and He said, It is good. It is good. It is good. After every time He creates, whatever He creates, He said, It is good. Then He said, It is not good that man should live alone. So He created woman, brought her unto the man. The two became one. But then, in Genesis chapter 3, Something not so good happened to this couple. They sinned. They disobeyed God. They were unwilling to obey His command. Remember back in our beginning passage, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19? Those that are willing and obedient. You see, Adam and Eve were not willing to obey God's command. And the result of that was that they, they sinned, they disobeyed, they fell, and the result of their fall was all the problems that they went through from that time forward, all the grief and pain that they experienced in their life. Their sons, one killing the other, all a result of man's disobedience. Every marital family problem is a spiritual problem. That's where it begins. And so you must address this issue. How is your spiritual life? Is, are you doing well? If you don't know Christ, I want to encourage you to receive Him. You know, John 1.12 declares, To as many as received Him, gave He the power to become the sons of God. All you have to do is receive Him. If you do know Christ, if you're a Christian, then you need to make a commitment to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in your daily life. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There is your guarantee. There is your promise. You must walk in the Spirit, which means you have to develop your spiritual life. Now, uh, the third uh, aspect of building a better marriage is you have to be willing to reconcile all and any unresolved conflict that you have with your mate. Now, unresolved conflicts are, are what really divides people in their relationship. I have found in marriage counseling that unresolved conflicts are like a brick that a person builds into a wall. Every unresolved conflict is like an individual brick. And they mortar that brick into the wall. And pretty soon that wall gets pretty high if you don't resolve the issue. Unresolved conflicts create that estrangement, that alienation, that separateness, that feeling alone in a marriage. And so if you feel alone, if you feel separate, if you feel estranged from your mate, I guarantee you there are some unresolved conflicts there. You have to address those issues. 
they must be resolved. In marriage counseling, I spend the majority of my time taking those bricks out of the wall in people's lives and people's marriages and helping them to understand the principles by which they can resolve them and continue to resolve the future conflicts that come up. Now, I believe that unresolved conflicts, really, they are the, it's the greatest reason why couples get divorced. A person builds that wall high enough and thick enough, long enough, and they can't get over it, they can't get around it, they can't get through it. And finally, they just, one or the other, just gives up. They just give up. They just say, you know, I can't do this. It's not going to work. And so I would encourage you, don't let any brick get mortared into a wall between you. You have to address them. Where do you begin? How do you begin? Well, you have to first examine yourself. Matthew 7, 5 is probably the most important principle in resolving conflicts. And if, if we would follow this principle, I'm guaranteeing you we would be able to resolve anything and everything. Because this principle addresses you. Now, many times when couples come in for counseling, they, they're, they're pointing the finger. They're going, well, he did this and she did that. And, and I usually ask them, okay, but what are you doing wrong in this marriage? And then there's the silence that comes upon the room. Well, and then it's back to pointing the finger again. It's what are you doing? You see, Jesus said, first, first, remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Or you could put your mate's eye into that passage. So, what... Do you need to change? Where are you failing? Where are you selfish? Where are you prideful? Where are you being stubborn? Where are you critical? Where are you harsh? You see, that is the question. If you will address those issues in your own life, whatever those issues are, because they're different for every one of us, if you will address those issues, you know what will happen? God will heal that relationship. You will be humbled. You will be convicted. And then all you have to do is just come back and confess that to your mate. Now, you can't argue very long when you're confessing your fault. When you're pointing the finger at somebody else's fault, you can argue all night. You can argue all week, right? And it just goes on and on and on. But when you come confessing your fault you literally are taking the weapon out of your, your spouse's hand. Because what are they going to condemn you with? What are they going to uh, tell you you're doing? You're, you're confessing it to them. You're acknowledging your own fault. And so I encourage you, determine what your faults are and ask forgiveness. Listen if there's anything more that you forgot and confess that and then seek a solution. Start talking and trying to find a solution to that issue. And a solution is found usually when someone says, if you would just do this, I would not get upset. There is your solution right there. And your mate is usually the one giving you the solution. I'd never, I wouldn't get angry if you would just have called. If you would have just said it a little nice, more nicely. A little more kindly. There's your solution. You need to be more kind or more considerate. Now fourth, you need to be willing to develop companionship on every level of your relationship. Now this is critical. Companionship is the reason why you are married. It is the fundamental purpose for two people getting married. They are married to be companions one of another. Notice in Genesis 2.18, it says this. It declares, 
For God said, it is not good that man should live alone or be alone. He said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, if God makes a, a helper comparable to me, then that means I need some help. And God made a helper comparable to me and comparable to you. Now, that, that word comparable literally means a counterpart. That's what the Hebrew word means. God makes a counterpart to you. That means that, that your spouse is not like you. They are going to be different than you, but they are matched to you. Now you say, well, Steve, I don't know about that. I don't think we're too, too well matched. Uh, we fight a whole lot. Well, fighting really doesn't determine whether you are matched or compatible with one another. Fighting is you're just in the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit, and you're not receptive to where your mate is at. Because you see, two people can grow together over the years. They can change and mature and find solutions with each other and over those issues that they battle with. And they can grow together as one because that's what the Bible promises is going to take place. God says the two shall become one. Now, are you going to contradict God's word there and say the two are not going to become one? They are not really going to experience that oneness? Because that's his intention and his desire. What keeps that from happening? Well, just not walking in the Spirit. Not being willing and obedient. That's what keeps that from happening. And allowing those conflicts to build up and not get resolved. And so companionship really is the bottom line. God says the two shall become one flesh. Then in Malachi chapter 2 verse 14, there Malachi says concerning um, marriage, he said, and she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Now that's an interesting word, companion. It's a Hebrew word that means one with whom you are knit together with. And so it describes this knitting together of two pieces of yarn into one, making this beautiful design, a finished product, a, a, a afghan or, or whatever is being knit. It's a beautiful piece of a work of art that somebody has labored over, intertwining these two pieces of yarn to make one. And so it's a beautiful picture, really, of what the Lord does in our lives. That intertwining, that companionship, that being knit together must take place spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, parentally, and sexually. It, it has to take place on all those levels. That is God's design and purpose. And so... When you refuse companionship spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, communicatively, parentally, sexually, what you're doing is you're undermining the very purpose for which you are married. And that will always equal trouble. It will always equal problems. And so you have to address this issue in your personal life. Where are you struggling in your companionship? And every couple, it's just, it's a little different. I mean, some couples struggle in their, they just don't see eye to eye on the way they parent. Or they don't see eye to eye on, on spiritual things. Or they, they're on two different wavelengths spiritually. One is committed, the other is not. One wants to pray with the other, the other does not. And that's going to create a problem. And so you have to address this. When we study the Song of Solomon in our next studies, you're going to see that this couple is experiencing companionship on every single level. It's the, it's the most beautiful illustration of what God wants to do in your marriage. 
there is a spiritual, emotional, intellectual, communicative, sexual relationship between these two. And it's, a, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, there Paul says concerning believers in general, he says he prayed that their hearts would be encouraged being knit together in love. If you want your marriage to be encouraged, to be taken to a better place than it is, then your heart has to be knit together with your spouse. If that is the intention for Christians in general, believers within the body of Christ, we are to be knit together in our hearts. How much more should that be taking place in a marriage? where two people are knit together as husband and wife. Your hearts have to be knit together. Are your hearts being knit together? Or are you pulling those stitches in your knitting experience? Which is it? I believe God wants to take you deeper there. Number five, if you want a better marriage, you need to identify the issues that hinder your communication and increase the bonding relationship between you. Now, again, in every relationship that there is a conflict, usually it has something to do with the way people communicate. Communication and the, the hindrances in your communication and unresolved conflicts usually go directly together. And so if you want to be knit together, it will require communication, good communication. And that doesn't happen right off the bat in many marriages. In fact, many times it takes years for two people to really learn how to communicate with each other and what, what enables and fosters good communication with each other. And so it is something that you really have to work on. In James chapter 3, verse 2, it says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man or a complete man, a mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. You see, James is talking about the tongue and the way we talk with one another. And if we do not stumble someone with our tongue, then it really declares that we are a mature man believer. A mature man or woman will get a grip on the way they communicate, the way they talk. They will get a grip on that little member that causes so much trouble. Your tongue. In Proverbs 18, 21, it declares that life and death are in the power of your tongue. Life and death. You know, which are you experiencing? Are you experiencing life in your relationship because of your tongue? Or death in your relationship because of your tongue? You see, one or the other will be the result. And so I encourage you, stop and look at your, the attitudes that you have. Look at the words that you use. And look at the behavior or the actions that you take when you communicate. Think of this. Look at the attitude first. Attitude is very important because you can hear somebody's attitude before they have finished one sentence. Correct? Before one full sentence has come out of your spouse's mouth, you know what attitude they have. You see, that attitude can be haughty. It can be resentful. It can be uh, very cutting, arrogant, sarcastic. And I'll tell you, how do you respond when your mate speaks to you that way? Now, not well. The wall is going up, correct? You're not going to be real receptive because you're not being spoken to in a kind way. One of my favorite passages is Judges 19.3, where it speaks there about a woman who committed adultery on her husband. And this is what the scripture said he did. 
Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. Now, would that have been the way you have, would have handled it? To speak kindly and to bring her back, to reconcile with her. You see, speaking kindly would be the only way that could ever be healed and reconciled. In Proverbs 25.15, it declares, A gentle tongue breaks the bone. Gentle words are more powerful, are, are more authoritative, are stronger than breaking somebody's arm. Gentle words. The opposite does just the opposite. It doesn't do anything but build a wall between you and your spouse. Do you use, what kind of words do you use? Do you use harsh words, lying words, cruel words, condemning words? You see, the words that you use and that you choose to use are very important. Again, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up strife. It stirs it up. So when you are harsh and using those kind of words with a bad attitude, you're going to have lots of strife. And so, address the kinds of words that you choose to use. Soft words instead of harsh words. The scripture says in Luke 6.37, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. When a, when a spouse starts condemning another uh, mate, their mate, what happens? Well, the other person usually ends up getting upset, and they start condemning too. You see, harshness begets harshness. And what you have to do is you have to sow the Spirit and you're going to reap life. You have to sow gentle words, and hopefully you will reap those same kind of words. And then the behaviors and the actions that you take. Do you blame shift when you communicate? Do you, do you always point the finger and fault back on your mate? That's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. You know, it's the woman you gave me, God. Oh, it's the devil. He made me do it. That's blame shifting. And that really affects no change at all. Do you interrupt each other? Do you finish each other's sentences? Do you explode in anger when your mate's trying to communicate with you? You see, all those behaviors destroy your ability to communicate, thus destroying your ability to resolve the conflict, thus destroying your companionship. And so you lose all the way across the board. And so address these issues. Number six, you need to develop greater friendship, romance, and intimacy with your mate. Now the reason why we're going to study the Song of Solomon in this series of studies is because it's one of the most romantic books uh, that I have ever read. It is uh, one of the most intimate and yet very discreetly done uh, pieces of literature that will encourage and benefit and bless you. But it describes the romantic relationship between Solomon and his wife. Now, how did they get to that particular place? Well, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at each of the specific aspects of how they got to that place. But I believe that it begins critically with Song of Solomon, chapter 5, and verse 16, where Solomon's wife makes a declaration about her husband. And she says there, This is my beloved, and this is my friend. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. You see, they had this beautiful friendship with each other. Now, whenever uh, couples come and ask me, you know, and before they get married, you know, should we get married? That's probably the first question I ask them is, is this person your best friend? 
Because I'll tell you, that's who you need to marry. Now, many times people marry their best friend, people that they have just this beautiful friendship with. But after they're married a while, they are not their best friend any longer because they allow all the conflicts to build up and those walls build up. And I'll tell you, it destroys the friendship that they used to have with each other. But friendship is really what enables the romance in this relationship, the passion that these two had for each other. And so when couples come in and they say to me, Steve, there's no passion, there's no fire in our marriage anymore, there's no romance, I mean, it's just kind of dead. I, you know what I ask them to do? I encourage them, you know what you need to do? So go back and start with friendship. Address the issues of friendship in your relationship. Start there. Why aren't you friends any longer? Well, it's because we haven't been resolving conflicts. We can't even talk to each other. Well, there's the two issues. You see, you can't talk to each other. You can't, if you can't talk to each other, you can't resolve a conflict, that's for sure. And so, once you start working through those, those issues and resolving the problems, and then take some actions that will get you back into friendship. Do some fun things together. Do you still do fun things together? Fun together equals friendship. That's what you did when you dated each other, right? I don't care how old you are, how long you've been married. It doesn't make any difference at all. You can still have fun with each other. And that means doing something fun together. That equals friendship. That friendship will equal romance. And romance will equal intimacy with each other. Companionship. A depth of companionship with each other that can be found no other place. If you want to have a friend, then you need to be a friend. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, the golden rule. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. So whatever you want your mate to do for you, just ask yourself right now, are you doing that for them? Well, you know, she just doesn't get it. She just doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. Doesn't understand. Well, I've told him a thousand times. Well, I'm not doing that anymore if he's not doing it anymore. And two people just begin to go like this. They just back off from each other and it only gets worse. This is where agape love comes into play. You take actions even when your spouse is not responding the way you want them to. What that does is it motivates and stirs them up, provokes them to love. This again is what the scripture teaches us to do. Hebrews 10.25 Provoke one another to love and good works. Or excuse me, Hebrews 10.24 Provoke one another to love and good works. Are you provoking each other? to love, or are you provoking each other to wrath? Very important. Seventh and last, stop the threats of divorce or insinuation, insinuations of to divorce or separation. If you don't like it, there's the door. Any statement like that is, is not going to help you build anything. Because, or especially if you are threatening divorce. Why don't we just get a divorce? You know, we've been arguing about this for I don't know how long. Why don't we just end this thing? And put, put us out of our misery. This, and yet all that does is add a whole bunch more misery. All I can say to you is that you can't build anything if you threaten to destroy it all. If that, those words are continually coming out of your mouth to threaten to destroy your relationship, how can you ever even begin to build anything? You know, if you went out and you began to build something in your backyard and somebody else came out and tore it all down, 
then you'd go out and build it again and they'd come out and tear it all down. You wouldn't get anywhere, would you? Why? Because somebody's tearing down what you're building. It just is a logical conclusion. And so verbally, you cannot build your relationship if you're threatening to destroy your relationship. Instead, why not verbalize your commitment as God does? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 10, or verse 5, it says there, God makes a declaration uh, to us of his commitment, his absolute commitment to us. What does he say? We all know the passage. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the most comforting, encouraging, uplifting, assuring statement that someone could make. So, are you making those kind of statements to your mate? Honey, I love you. I'd marry you again if it was tomorrow. If the wedding was tomorrow, I'd, I love you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Hebrew, or uh, Isaiah 55, 54, verse 10. Isaiah 54, 10 says, again, God's commitment to his people. For the mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. What a commitment. You see, my kindness will not depart from you. My love is not going to change, but it's going to grow. It's going to mature. It's going to develop. It's going to deepen. That is what God desires for your marital relationship, for your love relationship with your spouse. But you have to do something. You have to communicate. You have to verbalize that commitment to him or to her. Do it. Do it tonight. You know, if you've made those statements, you've threatened divorce, you need to ask forgiveness for that. You need to ask, on your way home tonight, honey, forgive me for ever bringing that subject up. And reconcile that. And just make a commitment to God in prayer. This is not an option. The option is, is to grow and to mature and to reconcile and to develop our relationship. That's the option. Because that is the command of God's Word. That's what God commands you to do. So that should really, for a Christian, be the only option that you would want to take. Don't look for the, the way out. Look up. Look to Him. He's the author and the finisher of your faith, and He will finish in you and in your marriage what He started. Believe Him to do it. I want to thank you for watching our program. I trust that God has spoken to your heart and ministered to you many truths concerning how to resolve the problems in your marriage. I believe that God is reaching out to you and He's trying to show you the way to solve these issues. For those of you that have never made a commitment to Christ, your first step is to come to Christ. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you want that rest? Do you want His peace? Do you want His power in your life? Then ask Him to come in and take over your life right now. Ask Him to forgive you and to fill you with His Holy Spirit, and He will radically change your life and your marriage. For those of you that have already made a commitment to Christ, you're a Christian, I would encourage you, stop and consider where are you failing in your marriage, and then obey God's commands, those commands that you've heard in this study, and then trust Him to do it. Trust His promise that He will come and help you if you'll ask. Jesus said, again, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. May the Lord richly bless your marriage. You are the hand That catches my fall You are the friend That answers
answers my call You are my day You are my night You are my love You are my my sin 